welcome to the first discussion that Canada's McDonald Laurie Institute is proud to convene with India's Observer Research Foundation as part of a series uh, dis discussing the critical issues facing both countries uh, in the road ahead. I'm Shuvalay Majumdar. I'm program. I'm foreign policy program director and Monk Senior Fellow at the McDonald Laurie Institute. So welcome to a, a fascinating discussion that we have uh, for you to kick off our dialogue. The topic will be on Afghanistan. For most of the 21st century, Canadian troops had been present in Afghanistan, yet still, like much of the world, Canada was caught off guard. The Taliban takeover now threatens to overturn two decades of significant progress for Afghans, progress which has come at the cost of tremendous blood and treasure in Canada and among all allies involved. Most worryingly, our Afghan partners and allies, the present situation is one of constant and looming threats of lethal reprisals uh, from the Pakistan-backed terrorist group in the Taliban and their other proxy partners, which now attempt to govern from Kabul. But without substantial assets of its own in the region, Canada has few means to secure its interests and assist our allies. Similarly, India has important ties, interests, and investments in Afghanistan. As the most critical regional partner for Afghanistan before the Taliban reseized control, India has contributed greatly to humanitarian and development assistance, infrastructure investment, and much, much more. Better than most nations, New Delhi appreciates the pivotal destabilizing role played by Pakistan in terms of sheltering and aiding the Taliban. And India also sees more clearly than most the geostrategic opportunity that China intends to seize upon with the overthrow of Afghan's democratically elected government. Yet the international community remains slow at recognizing the nature of these threats and the need to work with India to meet them. To discuss these issues, uh, we've assembled a distinguished panel of some of the most notable experts uh, that have touched both Canada and India in profoundly important ways. Chris Alexander, former Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan, former UN deputy special representative of the Secretary General for Afghanistan, and former Canadian Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. We have Professor Harsh V. Pant, Strategic Studies and Head of Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation. Kriti Shah, Fellow in the Department of Strategic Studies at the Observer Research Foundation. And Sushant Sareen, uh, Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and one of the world's most uh, knowledgeable experts on Pakistan and its state terror as statecraft. And of course, uh, the mighty Khorshid Nisrati, uh, former journalist working with major American media, uh, having covered Afghanistan in the field and now works with Afghan civil society abroad. Thank you all for your for your time. Khorshid Nusrati, you've been following Afghanistan and its issues very closely for a very long period of time. You've been an international journalist, um, and more recently you're focusing specifically on humanitarian concerns that are pressuring Afghans uh, as the Taliban have now tried to take control of the state apparatus and govern the country. From your perspective today, as we get this dialogue discussed, uh, uh, started, what is your sense as to what the humanitarian situation is like on the ground across Afghanistan today? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me here. It's great to see you again, Shuv. Um, yes, the situation in Afghanistan is, is dire and um, it is, have, um, on the verge of, of becoming a humanitarian disaster. I mean, we have to remember that even before the Taliban regained control, Afghanistan was going through a continued a humanitarian crisis on many, many fronts. Um, so the Taliban regime or the, the retake of Afghanistan by the Taliban is only exacerbating problems that were already there tenfold. Primarily, the concern right now is the collapse of the Afghanistan economy and the, uh, the lack of food and resources and medicines and just vital supplies that the Afghan people need. Um, continued drought has affected the ability of Afghans to produce their own food. Uh, but these shortages are are just are just terrible. So you're seeing massive amounts of people who are becoming malnutritioned and children that are on the verge of 
of potentially dying. And with the winter coming on, the harsh Afghanistan winters, this is of real concern. So there's shortages of food, electricity outages, um, and without electricity, you can't pump water, uh, you cannot uh, supply uh, power to hospitals and clinics. It, so if you're looking at this potential disaster, it's not only food and, and sh shortages of water, it's also electricity, and it is lack of access to cash. Literally, the banks were closed, as we all know, by the Taliban. They have reopened on certain dates, but, but individuals and businesses are only able to withdraw potentially up to $200 when they have access to cash, and they're not able to pay uh, salaries to, to staff, and individuals aren't able to get cash to be able to buy food if it is available. And in particular, Afghan women, healthcare workers, and educators have not received salaries for nearly the past three months. And oftentimes those, those women are the, the key breadwinners in their families. So this is really starting to just have a domino effect with the fact that there were already shortages to begin with, but now with the Taliban in control, uh, any kind of corridors that would allow for supplies to come in and food to come in and just access to water, electricity, as I said, uh, and cash are suddenly becoming, um, it's, it's becoming a desperate situation. And there's real, real concern that as the winter comes on, which, which many of us know from being in Afghanistan, it's quite harsh. So um, I think this is something that is of critical importance and that uh, the international community and bilateral organizations uh, need to take a serious look at. No, thank you. I greatly appreciate that. It's absolutely a, a dire situation as we see it unfold in the last weeks. Um, and so let me now turn to Kriti, who I think spends quite a bit of time looking at Afghanistan and Pakistan's relationships, the governance inside Afghanistan, uh, fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, Kriti, when you look at the actors who are governing Afghanistan today um, and the reluctance of the international community to uh, immediately acknowledge the Taliban as the representative of the people, what do you see as groups in the country that could be interacted with to provide basic humanitarian assistance um, in um, the international approach to help the Afghan people and their humanitarian situation today? Pretty, to you. Sorry, Shubh. I think I got uh, a bit of your question. I'm having a bit of an audio lag, and your video sort of freezes. Um, you know, it's still early days in terms of trying to understand who is it uh, in Afghanistan that India can deal with or the international community can look to uh, to be able to provide much necessary humanitarian assistance uh, and sort of just get the Afghan economy functioning again. Um, so it's still early days, and I think uh, this is the point of how where regional countries can uh, come together, look at different frameworks, look at different areas in terms of um, are we looking are we looking at India's cooperation with the Central Asian republics? Are we looking at um, are there certain U, uh, U.S. groups or U.N. groups uh, that through which we can fund that aid? So it's still early days that we're looking at, but of course, like. Uh, it was mentioned the situation remains, of course, extremely dire. Uh, and it's very troubling to see uh, the situation that it, it's become so bad so quickly. Um, and I think it's going to get worse in the coming weeks. And it really depends on how um, which countries begin to diplomatically recognize the Taliban. Uh, what sort of I'm sure we'll come to this in the discussion. But how do countries such as uh, what sort of uh, sort of resources that for example, China, which has had historical relationships with the Taliban, even in their earlier government, uh, what sort of aid do they, they provide? Uh, does that bring the Afghan uh, people a certain level of relief for the time being? Uh, and of course, how the Taliban policy towards uh, minorities, towards women, um, whether there's any shift or whether there's any uh, room for them to sort of accept that sort of, uh, accept little change in their ideology or in their uh, thinking to be able to accept that aid. So it's still, of course, early days. And I think uh, the different regional countries are going to have to figure out what sort of route they're going to have to take to get into Afghanistan. But let's see how uh, the next few uh, months, 
just before the winter pan out. Thank you very much. That's a perfect assessment as to how different, at least in the countries in the neighborhood, are going to and interacting with the Afghan people, which, as we all know, is far beyond just who are in charge in Kabul. Uh, so let me with that turn now to Chris Alexander, uh, Canada's former ambassador to Afghanistan, um, head of the United Nations uh, Assistance Mission in Afghanistan's political section and former minister. Chris, you, you've spent a lot of time thinking and looking at Central Asia, living in Central Asia. Um, when you look at the immediate neighborhood of Afghanistan, could you give us a sense as to what the relationship could best look like for Afghanistan by each of its neighbors? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Afghanistan is this heart of Asia um, in Iqbal's famous phrase, which everyone in the region knows. Uh, and so it is connected primarily to, and most uh, accessibly to Central Asia and Iran, but obviously also to uh, Pakistan and the rest of South Asia and through the Wuhan corridor to, uh, to China. So it has, as 20 years of rhetoric uh, insisted, you know, most notably by Ashraf Ghani, the potential to be the crossroads of Asia. Uh, but only if it stops being the battlefield of Asia and the punching bag of, uh, of, of Pakistan's military who have sought um, the upper hand there for now close to 50 years uh, and, and think that they have won it back, um, as Rashid says, with the Taliban regaining power. But what should relations look like? I mean, we have seen... Um, through most of the period of jihad in the 80s, civil war in the 90s, the emergence of the Taliban, and then the last 20 years, Pakistan be the principal economic partner of Afghanistan with the lion's share of, uh, of, of trade, um, the largest um, daily and annual exchanges of human capital, uh, you know, people literally going back and forth to trade daily in some cases. Um, but Iran came close to rivaling uh, Pakistan at several points in the last 20 years. Uh, and there was a strategy, obviously developed jointly with India, to make Iran an even more um, seamless and frictionless uh, partner uh, that would rely on the port of Bandar Abbas to create an alternative to Karachi and as the Pakistanis would like to see down the road, Gwadar. Meanwhile, uh, trade with Central Asia remained quite frozen. Uh, there was growth uh, sort of at the, at the, at the retail level um, with Tajikistan, never really very much with Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan still remains something of a Herbit kingdom. So the numbers never got very high on either of those fronts because of Central Asia's abiding uh, fear of extremism coming from Afghanistan, coming principally from Pakistan. <clears throat> and so they kept the walls literally um, preventing economic activity from coming over the Amudarya um, quite high. That uh, th those fears about terrorism are obviously now even more acute, um, but the dynamic is changing because there's a new government in Uzbekistan and because Tajikistan has resumed its position as the de facto headquarters of the Afghan resistance uh, and, and will automatically be playing a resupply role and could potentially play uh, a larger role as a base for humanitarian actions. I think the key point here is to, is to make is this. As long as Pakistan and uh, Iran remain renegades uh, subject to isolation and with growing prospects of sanctions by the international community, it's going to be hard for them to develop a lot of economic uh, up, upturn with Afghanistan. Uh, moreover, 
there is now a play, I think, very transparently by Pakistan to uh, really use the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan to blackmail the rest of the world, to say, um, you need to recognize these people in Kabul, even though there are proxies, even though we've done this to the whole world, because otherwise Afghans will starve. And by the way, to relieve this suffering, you need to operate through uh, Pakistan, and there's a price for doing that. Our response, in my view, sh should be, um, no, we don't need to recognize anyone. Uh, we are going to operate to meet humanitarian needs. We're going to do it independently of the government. We're going to do it through UN agencies and capable NGOs. And if you stop us, we're going to scream from the rooftops worldwide that you are uh, engaged in genocide here. Uh, and 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 uh, so get out of the way. Um, and but to to have leverage in that discussion, we need to be able to talk about uh, a, an economic relationship which is going to be principally focused on humanitarian effort uh, that that doesn't just come from Afghanistan. We need to talk about it coming from Iran. We need to talk about it coming from um, Tajikistan and potentially Uzbekistan. Uh, and, and then only then uh, bring Pakistan into the equation. I think the bottom line is that under the Taliban, there isn't much prospect for economic development of any kind, no matter how great the illusions of some people in Beijing or elsewhere. Um, that's not their agenda. That's not their record. I don't see that changing. Thank you very much, Chris. And <clears throat> let me just um, suggest, Chris, I, I think your mic might be crackling a little bit by touching against something. So uh, just okay. give an example of that. I can't, no problem. Um, but I think this is a great bridge to, to turn to Professor Harsh Pant uh, from a perspective in New Delhi about the same set of geopolitical issues that immediately are affecting the dire situation that Afghans are facing right now. Um, Professor, when you look at the uh, survey of uh, issues that Chris just articulated for Afghanistan's neighborhood, where do you think... Um, that New Delhi would see generally eye to eye with the kind of assessment that he's provided, uh, perhaps with the idea of where there could be opportunities between the West and India uh, to find common coalitions on how to engage the country, whether it is to provide humanitarian assistance or even on a longer term basis. Professor, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Shuk, uh, And thank you for having me as part of this conversation. Uh, see, uh, I think what Chris laid out uh, perhaps is a very logical assessment of the region and how uh, the, the regional players have looked at it. Uh, we have talked about uh, Afghanistan being the heart of Asia, you know, the whole heart of Asia conference initiative. But we also know how um, the heart has been pierced from multiple sides. You have multiple geopolitical actors who have their own geopolitical understanding of how, how Afghanistan is to be used in some ways. And that is what... Uh, uh, brought us to this uh, extremely serious and catastrophic situation at the moment where, uh, you know, uh, where a seemingly corrupt government, uh, inefficient government uh, has been given a go-by for an ideologically uh, depraved regime. Uh, for all the faults that Ghani governments and other governments have had in Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, we, we, and I think for that, when we go back and the West reassesses its own role in America in particular, the fact that year after year we were being told how bad these governments were, they were not working. Of course, you know, democracy is not perfect. Look at American democracy. I mean, we are, Americans are not perfect. Canadians are not perfect. Indians are not perfect. We are a democracy is a work in progress. But year after year to be told that, look, here is a government and we are, we are paying money. And this is not working out. Over over a period of time, it, it you know, it the, 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 the institutions lost credibility both externally and internally amongst the people. And so it's, it's, it's not a surprise that Taliban are back in power uh, and, and, and now we are being told that, look, this is what the majority wants. Certainly not. Uh, you know, there's, uh, so, so in a sense, the, the past will, uh, will cast a long shadow over this humanitarian crisis because from India's perspective, where India would be cautioning its partners, that ultimately, as, as Chris was saying, this is about Pakistan now blackmailing the international community once again and saying, look, start helping these guys. You have uh, 
you know, Pakistan's ministers and national security advisor has written a piece in foreign affairs. Uh, it is basically arguing that this is the most important thing that you can do for Afghans now is to recognize the government and work with the government and so on and so forth. So the challenge I think for India is that India has to convince its partners, its friends, its allies that look, uh, whatever leverage international community has, it, it is it is there today and it has to be used judiciously and very, very carefully because once you have used it, you really can't reuse it. So whether it is about good behavior, whether it is about financial access, whether it is about humanitarian assistance or even legitimacy, how are we going to make sure that your red lines are respected and that, that once again, you're not falling in the trap of those who have sold you this story time and time again, uh, mostly to their benefit and not to the benefit of ordinary Afghans. So I think uh, that is something that, that we saw and we have seen India trying to address this via uh, multiple engagements uh, with its, uh, not only with its neighbors, but also with, with countries from, you know, from the US, um, uh, you know, Australians and, uh, and uh, uh, Central Asians and Russia. Very important uh, in, in that sense that, you know, initial enthusiasm of Russia for the Taliban has subsided a bit. And India is a reason why that has happened. Uh, it, so I think... Uh, what the, the way we are looking, I think from New Delhi's perspective, the way it looks at the moment is that, yes, things have fallen apart. Yes, it's a very difficult moment. And I think nobody feels it more the, for Afghans and Indians because of the, uh, of, you know, of the kind of engagement, even personal level engagements that we have had uh, with, with, uh, with ordinary Afghans. But I think at the end of the day, uh, it, it is going to be a very calculated move from now on because clearly uh, the, you know, the recognition is there that there is a fatigue in the West. And if there is a fatigue in the West about Afghanistan, then the regional players will have to do more of the heavy lifting. So what does that mean in real terms, in real resources, in real time? I think that is a consideration that India today is looking at when you are, when you are looking to uh, the larger question of, uh, you know, of humanitarian assistance, which is certainly, as everyone has pointed out, is the need of the hour. But what kind of institutional mechanisms you use? How do you use, uh, you know, which uh, groups you use, which partnerships you leverage, which engagements you try to uh, factor in as you uh, try to reach out to those uh, who need it the most? I think those are essential questions. And unless uh, the like-minded countries, unless those uh, who believe in a certain kind of Afghanistan are willing to sit together uh, and, uh, you know, and, and deliberate, I don't think we are going to find an easy solution. The solution is not going to come and say that, you know, there is enough money, let's let's distribute it uh, through through the Taliban regime. And Taliban is, you know, they are not interested. The governance has never been their agenda. So why would a humanitarian crisis is something that, again, uh, will be used by them for all sorts of reasons, for not for the right reasons that we uh, we would like. So I think it's, it's, a, it's going to be a very calculated assessment from now on. I don't see any um, hurry in New Delhi for making uh, any moves at this point. I think uh, still... Uh, the kind of negotiations that are happening. A U.S. Uh, Deputy uh, Secretary of State was in was in India um, this week, uh, and and she made it very clear that America is in no hurry, that we are not in a hurry to uh, to provide. And I think the engagements, continuous engagements with uh, with uh, the U.S. on this question uh, become important because India is trying to make it very clear the issue of leverage that that, that once again has to be used very very carefully. So I think by and large uh, that. You know, there is there is a larger contestation going on and we will hear the, the Pakistan and China bad narrative and we will hear another narrative. How these two contestations shape up will be will be will play an important role in what actually happens on the ground in Afghanistan. And it's a perfect setup for Sushant Sareen Harsh. So thank you for it, because I was going to ask now um, uh, one of the world's foremost scholars about Pakistan and its state apparatus. Um, Sushant, you would have read Chris Alexander's paper published earlier this year on Pakistan's proxy war in Afghanistan. Um, and you heard Chris Alexander uh, describe uh, how Pakistan has been exploiting the humanitarian situation of the Afghan people to validate the Taliban. Uh, you've heard from Khorshid and Priti on the dire situation that the Afghan people are facing right now. And Harsh has just set the table for you perfectly to say, to the audience here, give us a sense as to exactly how Pakistan and their proxies in Afghanistan 
would play this humanitarian situation out? How, who, who in the country are they actually effectively governing through? And are there other options in the country that speak for the Afghan people, that speak for uh, the constitutional republic that Afghans have endorsed through six elections? Uh, try as best as you can from your perspective to give us a sense as to what is that anatomy of cooperation presently between Pakistan and its proxies inside Afghanistan? Uh, thanks, Shav. Uh, that's, you put a lot on my plate, but let me just try. Look, uh, here is the thing. I think uh, what the Pakistanis are just realizing is that, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were victorious in Afghanistan. All the uh, things which they tried to do over the last 20 years, they've, they've managed to gain control and put their proxies in the... Uh, and the proxies are essentially the Haqqanis, but some among the other uh, Taliban factions as well. But by and large, I think the Pakistanis feel that they can now call the shots. I think they have another thought coming, partly because there is, we are already seeing some signs of a pushback from the Afghanistan side, uh, but also because suddenly uh, they're landed with the situation that somebody has to foot the bills in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, none of the guys who were even engaging with the Taliban are ready to foot the bills. Now, you know, uh, the problem, however, is that we've, we, are, we are all very concerned about the humanitarian crisis. Uh, it's not just looming, it's on the people in Afghanistan. But I think uh, what, what uh, Harsh was saying needs to be taken forward. Uh, a humanitarian crisis uh, cannot become a backdoor to legitimization uh, or recognition of the Taliban. Now, that is precisely what the Pakistani game plan is. Because if they were to try and sell the Taliban otherwise to the world, uh, even the guys who are backing the Taliban are now, you know, uh, pulling back from that. Uh, we see that in uh, among the Russians. We see that also among the uh, among the Iranians and uh, the Tajiks also seem to uh, be pushing back against the Taliban. So one is how do you manage the humanitarian crisis or ease the humanitarian crisis uh, with uh, without giving any kind of legitimacy to the Taliban and uh, by extension to whatever the Pakistani game plan is in Afghanistan. Uh, and there are no easy answers to this. But I think what is very important for us to also understand is that Afghanistan is a population of almost 40 million people, right? Uh, how much humanitarian aid are you going to be able to give to 40 million people? There are going to be serious limitations to what the world can do, number one. Number two, how does the world do it? Number three, uh, you know, the economic meltdown is just one part of the story. What was the foundation of that economy? You know, I think you need to get to the bottom of that uh, in, in terms of what was the productivity of the economy, what was that economy selling, what was that economy buying, where was the money coming from? Now, one part of it is that there was a, a, a state structure which was being funded primarily from the West. Uh, that funding is not going to come. And I don't see any of the other guys who were so involved in Afghanistan putting in that money. Uh, and, and that means that uh, is, uh, is Canada, is the US, are the European countries going to continue to pay the salaries of uh, people who are now going to be employed by the Taliban? How does that work? And I think we need to, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, logically uh, see how this thing is going to unfold. So one is that problem. And the other problem is that if you have uh, the cash crisis is partly because uh, you know, uh, of, of reasons that uh, nothing is coming into uh, the country. Uh, people who were to give in the notes are not giving in. Uh, there are uh, dollar reserves are ending uh, or have already, uh, you know, they've been frozen. And even if supposing those $9 billion were to be released, uh, how far does that take uh, that particular regime? Ultimately, you have to run the state. And, and apart from people who are employed by the government, there's this whole other economy which has to be taken care of, which was primi primarily being, uh, uh, you know, underwritten by uh, the presence of uh, foreigners inside Afghanistan and the money which was coming in. That is not going to come in anymore. And if you don't have any foundation to the economy, then how do you take things forward? How do you revive an economy 
whose basic foundations are shaken up. And I think those are going to be extremely serious questions. That is one part of it. The other part of it is that, uh, look, the, what the Pakistanis want in Afghanistan is, and, and, and this is not a new dream. Even in the 90s, when they first uh, got the Mujahideen government and later the Taliban into Afghanistan, the primary focus of the Pakistanis was how do they become the trade and transit hub for the newly independent Central Asian republics of those days. I think that same dream is being repeated once again. And they think that if those trade corridors open up, that will provide viability to Afghanistan. And I'm deeply skeptical about uh, that happening, uh, partly for security reasons and partly for pure economic reasons. Uh, why would any country want to use Afghanistan to come into Gwadar or to uh, uh, Karachi? And for what? To send what where? And I think somebody needs to sit down and look at the trade flows, the direction of trade, uh, and, uh, and, and that entire thing, that entire structure also of Central Asia to understand that that's not a workable proposition. To already see the Chinese also pulling back. They've, they promised, the Chinese promised the world to everybody. Uh, but I don't think the Chinese are going to uh, be very interested in investing anything in Afghanistan if there is going to be no return. And there is going to be no return. There is no return coming from Pakistan also. So essentially, you are in a situation, and this is where I come to the leverages which Harsh was talking about. Uh, your economic leverages are extremely important and extremely critical uh, to be utilized in a way that you can actually strangulate the Taliban uh, and, and uh, try and get rid of them. Uh, and the reason I say this is that uh, apart from being an abomination inside Afghanistan, the Taliban represent a global danger. And I don't think we should underestimate the troublemaking potential of uh, somebody like the Taliban in uh, having a state uh, to themselves, uh, because the repercussions of that are not going to be felt immediately in the next couple of months, but over decades now. And, and the sooner we all collaborate to ensure the collapse of this particular regime to be replaced by whatever else, but certainly not something which comes from this ideological uh, uh, spectrum, a uh, part of the ideological spectrum. I think it's important simply because if you understand where the Taliban are coming from, this is not an Afghan nationalist force. It is an out and out Islamist force. And, uh, and, and their ambitions are not going to be limited to only Afghanistan, regardless of what promises they are making, which are basically a cock and bull story in my view. So I think the, 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 the trick for us is how do we ensure whatever little humanitarian assistance that can be given is given without legitimizing the Taliban, number one. Number two, uh, how do we ensure uh, that the collapse of this particular regime uh, without supporting it? And that means resisting whatever snake oil the Pakistanis are selling, uh, you know, in terms of the humanitarian crises out there, the fact that they want to be the conduit for everything which goes into Afghanistan, because that adds to their leverages. Uh, so I think those are really the questions we uh, need to answer uh, out here today and uh, going forward. Excellent. Thank you for that. Hoshid, I'm going to turn to you next, because I, I want to thank you all for a brilliant opening salvo of responses that I think portray a range of modern issues that the Afghan people are affected by, not just their humanitarian situa situation today, but the way in which the region and um, their proxies are operating at the expense of the Af Afghan people. But Horshid, let me turn to you now, now to ask a little bit of what has changed in modern Afghanistan in the last 20 years? The last time the Taliban were in power, uh, we saw images and have heard testimonials of barbaric rule. But now we see um, at least them presenting in Kabul uh, a slightly more tempered version, a more sophisticated public relations effort. But in the Afghan people, what has changed from your perspective uh, over the last 20 years? What kind of country are the Taliban trying to occupy on behalf of their sponsors today? That's a very, very good question. Um, you know, 20 years ago, Afghanistan in its failed state status um, 
was just, I think, a, almost like a, a wasteland when it when it came to human rights, and civil liberties, access to education, and so on and so forth. Um, I think we all remember those images of once the Taliban were driven out in December of 2001, uh, just really a, such a traumatized nation of people that had endured atrocities and um, long periods of war. And so, and I have to say, I think Afghanistan is still a traumatized nation in many, many ways. But what has changed is during these past 20 years, despite any flaws or weaknesses, irregularities, and levels of corruption that we can all point to, um, there has been a lot of positive, there have been positive developments, especially I think for Afghan women and girls, but for Afghanistan overall, when it comes to um, sectors um, focused on education, access to education and higher education, um, creating a, a vibrant um, uh, a civil society where Afghan women um, have had such an incredible presence, not only um, in, in media, but as role models and political figures. Um, there have been, I think, um, there's been a development of infrastructure in different pockets across Afghanistan. Of course, a lot of that also was done on the done on the cheap because of corruption. So you see a lot of these projects that have unfortunately not been as strong or have failed, but there still has been a positive impact from some of these infrastructure projects. Um, but I think one can really point to the fact that the the return of women who and girls to society uh, brought energy and vibrancy and created a dynamic civil society where men and women could work and live together um, and, and try to move the country forward in a positive modern direction. And I think that, that you can point to, again, education, civil society, political presence, elections, um, the arts and the, uh, a vibrant music scene and art scene developing again. Um, healthcare, my God, I'm, I'm skipping over something that's so critically important. In 2001, the levels of maternal mortality and infant mortality were considered the highest in the world, if not vying or equal with Sierra Leone. And over 10 years, that those rates dropped significantly. And yet, Afghanistan still is a country that has very high maternal mortality rates um, and infant mortality rates. I, I last I read went from one in four children dying under five to one in five. Um, life expectancy rates uh, definitely improved. In most countries, women outlive men. Uh, but in Afghanistan, I, I believe in 2001, 2002, the the life expectancy rate for, for men were, was around maybe 45, 46, and for women around 42 or 43. And that, that reversed and that improved. Um, and so access to health care and um, better sanitation, um, neonatal care, just across the board, there were improvements that were brought about by the time and investment of the international community and donor community and the hard work of Afghans themselves who wanted a better life for themselves and their, their children, their families and their future. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes, which is very unfortunate, most people would only hear the stories of the tragedies in Afghanistan and there are plenty to point at, but there have been some real glimmers of hope and there have been some real incredible strides that have been made over these last 20 years. And that's why it's it makes it even sadder and harder to accept the fact that this situation has been created, um, this sense of, of abandonment by the West, uh, the feeling that all of this was for naught. Uh, and I, I, I struggle myself personally as an Afghan American and, and someone who spent time in Afghanistan trying to 
justify why this situation has come about and is there a better way? Is there is there a way that we can make amends for what has happened and politically not embolden or legitimize, uh, le uh, bring legitimacy to the Taliban regime, um, which I think that's going to be key, so that over time they will lose popularity. They will the the country unfortunately will will if it's not already a failed state. Uh, will somehow <laughs> implode in the sense that the, the people themselves will then rise up against the Taliban and hopefully drive them out. So I hope I've answered some of your questions, Shuv. No, you have. But let me also ask you this. So for Afghan girls and women who were born 20 years ago, they're 20 now, or were five years old or 10 years old at the fall of the Taliban the last time, they're between the age of 20 and 30 now and comprise a huge part of the, of the country. The country is also interconnected um, more than it has ever been before through technology, with technologies that we could never have imagined 20 years ago, frankly. Um, how do you think um, this resistance of Afghan women and girls might look uh, while the to want to encourage their education and their inclusion in Afghan society? Do you think that this kind of um, effort that's been put into the country for the last 20 years has built perhaps more resilience around the ideals that Afghans uh, aspire for themselves. This is absolutely true, is that the the, the Afghan population that the, the Taliban are encountering now are a completely different Af Afghan population that they um, than what they were in 1996 up through 2001 because of technology, because of all of these positive developments and because of this new generation that you're talking about that has been exposed and raised in an environment where it seemed like anything is possible and that you could be connected and through technology, I think is something that is tremendously powerful. And I believe that that is going to keep and help the resistance among Afghan women, girls, and the population at large, as long as they are able to have that feeling of connection with the global community um, through technology, uh, then I think that that is gonna be one of the positives because it'll keep them feeling connected and not marginalized and not locked away. Because that is one of the big concerns is right now what we're hearing from people on the ground is that so many Afghan women and girls are inside their homes. They're locked away. They're not venturing out. They're terrified. They don't know what's going to happen. They either are no longer able to go to school beyond a sixth grade education because of the ban on education. Um, many of them have lost their jobs and have been told not to return to work. Um, and so the fear is, is that unless you have that ability and access to the rest of the world, that mental strain, that, that, you know, incredible, the depression, the levels of mental instability and mental pressures are, are could really upend the spirit of these young Afghan men and women and girls. And so I think it's critical that as long, as long as technology is there, it's a lifeline. It's a lifeline to help keep that spirit alive and to keep reminding them there that there is an outside world um, and that that somehow it'll help we won't be able to continue giving them hope and eventually get getting them resources that they need um, and you know holding and basically holding a beacon from the rest of the world to to Afghan Afghan people who are locked away women and girls literally Thank you. So, Kriti, I know that we are uh, somewhat successful in connecting with you. Uh, I hope that this question comes to you, but let me summarize something here that I'm trying to get to. So, Sushant had mentioned that, um, you know, the underpinnings of the Afghan economy are something that we need to think carefully about what was and what, what could be, what, make, what would make the state viable. And Horsheed has done a very good job right now at describing the modern Afghan women who represent half the country's economic potential um, through their own productivity, but have now been jailed back in their home. You, Priti, are looking at um, the relationships that Afghanistan has with its neighbors, 
um, and you think about the potential of where the people could be challenge of the Afghan economy and its reconstruction. I ask this because I think that there is a larger geopolitical game here that I'd like to discuss as well with Harsh and with Chris shortly. But from your perspective in Afghanistan, uh, what do you see as uh, the greatest risks and perhaps the greatest opportunities uh, for the immediate months to come? So my apologies, I got a bit of your question. I don't know why I'm having uh, this technical difficulty, but I got a bit of it, so I'm just gonna try to answer whatever I did understand. Um, so like we've spoken about what are the, so, I mean, you asked what are the opportunities and what are the challenges? I think something that I wanted to build on what uh, Professor Pant and Sushant said, um, how do we sort of help Afghanistan without providing, of course, legitimacy to the group? How do we do it? How do we help Afghanistan without providing support to the Taliban? And more importantly, how do we do this without making Pakistan a conduit? Um, and I think that's very important. I think that is the way that India can look at cooperating with Canada, looking at cooperating with regional countries in terms of how can we sort of stop hyphenating the AFPAC region and just look at Afghanistan as Afghanistan is one and not sort of go through Pakistan. Um, and that's important. One of the way, one of the ways in which, um, in sort of in India's uh, cooperation with Afghanistan, it's it's been on many fronts. Uh, but of course, yeah, humanitarian assistance. In, India's had infrastructure projects and sort of many community-based development programs. So uh, when we look at India's assistance in food grain assistance, has been a very important part of India's humanitarian assistance to the country in the past. I think that's one immediate way that India can look um, at sort of helping alleviate. Uh, the problems that the Afghan economy is facing. The other way, when we talk about community-based development projects, and this becomes very difficult, uh, of course, with the Taliban in power, but there's still specific projects and specific areas of cooperation um, which will be beneficial. For example, uh, India has built uh, a children's hospital in Kabul uh, that continues to require um, sort of resources and you know uh, technical know-how. Uh, I think that's one way uh, of sort of moving the ball forward and providing very specific targeted assistance in those regards in the health sector. We're in the middle of a pandemic and you can sort of seize that opportunity, uh, one on the COVID side, but also in terms of in Indian projects on the ground to see how India can work with Canada or how India can work uh, with regional countries in those regards. Uh, so I think that's something important uh, to keep in mind. And when it comes to Pakistan, um, it's a small point. The, it's Of course, it's important to ensure that Pakistan uh, is sort of left out of this entire thing um, because the uh, the relationship between uh, Afghanistan, between the Taliban and Pakistan uh, is also going to enter a new stage and it's going to it's going to evolve as the ISI looks at sort of merging their old tactics and their new tactics together uh, and this is a new phase for them because now they need to support an international terrorist organization that's functioning as a government uh, and it's sort of it's been successful in mainstreaming terrorism and political violence. The ISI is very good at what they do. Um, but similar to what Kushit said, that it's similar to how the Taliban, the Afghanistan of the past is no longer the Afghanistan that exists for the Taliban today. And that gives the Taliban certain challenges. Uh, but it's the same way for the Taliban that you have the old Taliban and you have a new Taliban uh, with, a mu with a much younger generation of many people born post 9-11. Uh, and have greater autonomy. Uh, so I think that's something that's important to look at uh, going forward to see um, how that relationship between the ISI and the Taliban evolves and what sort of autonomy uh, do both do both groups give each other. Excellent, no, thank you for that. So Harsh, let me come to you now because I wanna pick up on a thread that you opened with your initial intervention here because I think it's most appropriate. Afghanistan is all, appears to be at a crossroads today where it is on the path of falling into Pakistan's sphere of orbit. But Pakistan doesn't have the economy that Sushant demands to actually lift Afghanistan's social and economic development in the ways that Kriti and Khorshid have discussed. China does. And the Chinese interest in Pakistan has obviously been transforming both Pakistan and Chinese-Pakistan relations. Uh, and their cooperation in Afghanistan has become even more intense on not just matters of 
common security, but also common economic objectives. Many people think, you know, China's predominant interest in Afghanistan is in its minerals. Others have a view that it has more to do with its geography and its access to the Central Asian states that, that Chris Alexander described in the beginning of his, uh, in his initial intervention. So Harsh, when you look at this adjusted alignment between China and Pakistan in Afghanistan and beyond to Central Asia and to other theaters, um, India is playing a much more central role in defining the economic and security features of not just Central and South Asia, but the world today. How do you think a partnership with India could be different this time around with this version of the Taliban and this modern Afghanistan uh, and, and its Western partners, whether it be Canada or other capitals uh, in Europe and America? Uh, Shuv, there has been this, you know, this uh, this problem when it comes to India and, and Afghanistan. Uh, that uh, for a long time, you know, we heard uh, there was this narrative that look, uh, uh, India does not matter. You know that uh, you, we can have London Conference of 2011. Uh, why would we? Why should we invite India? India is not really a party to to what is happening in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has many neighbors. India is not a contiguous entity. Uh, and then suddenly now, when India has lost. Uh, uh, sorry, so suddenly now when the Taliban are back, the narrative is that India has lost. So I think there is, you know, there is this, there is this larger sense. Uh, I think there is, there is a lack of an understanding in terms of uh, where India fits in in the larger geopolitical paradigm. And the way, in, the way India has looked at it uh, from uh, 2001 uh, is that, of course, there, there is a, there, you know, there has been a Pakistan element there. But I think that if you look at the, the regional countries, you know, who were all engaging at one point, very, very actively engaging the Taliban, whether it is China, whether it is Russia, whether it is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Central Asian countries, and even I would, I would put America, on, uh, you know, in the group. So what their, I think, engagement was based on a very basic calculus, right? So Chinese would say, look, we don't want any interference in Xinjiang, and do whatever you want to do. Uh, so, so. Within within Afghanistan, but don't bring it to Xinjiang, and we will we will help you. We will we will uh, we will make you a relevant player on the global stage. The Russians would, would would also engage on similar terms. They would say, "Don't come to Central Asia, but, uh, but you can do whatever you want. Rest is rest. We will take care of." So I think if you and, and Americans also did the same thing, right? The idea was that you know, well, don't attack us. Uh, uh, you know, don't allow your territory to be used to, to attack us. But uh, you know, let us see how we can work and. You had then uh, an entire theology being developed uh, as to how uh, you know, a new Taliban is emerging and Taliban are ready to be engaged with. This is going to be a different Taliban uh, and so on and so forth. So, so you have had an entire, we have, we, have, it's, we have spent an entire decade talking about the re-emergence of a new Taliban. And in a matter of months, that, that argument has been completely discredited. Now the question is, as far as India is concerned, India has al always maintained from the very, very beginning that, look, this is a dangerous territory. Once you start making this argument for, you know, in, in one particular instance for one group, you really don't know where you, where you would end up. And of course, it's a, nego it's a negotiation process. If, if during the negotiations, uh, Taliban would like to show you their best side, they would say they will make all sorts of commitments. But at the end of the day, you know, you will have no capacity to make sure that they deliver on those commitments. And that's exactly what happened. Now, India's role and, you know, India's challenge is slightly different. For India, the real security to Indian interests emerges only if there is a politically uh, stable Afghanistan, in a sense that, the, in a, in a, that there is a political structure in Afghanistan where everyone is involved, where all stakeholders are involved. If, if that does not happen, then I think the issue for India becomes that you will always have the simmering discontent and Afghanistan will never be able to emerge as, a, as an entity that can manage on its own uh, governance issues, its own political future and sole engagement with the neighbors. And I think that's exactly the challenge that the international community today is facing. Right? Taliban came to power. We were told that this is going to be a new Taliban inclusive government and they showed in Panjshir Valley what they did you know, they, and how they engaged with. If, if they were interested in, in being uh, a new Taliban, they could have easily, if, if they were in, interested in an inclusive government, they could have easily engaged with the with, with the Ghani government. They could have reached a modus vivendi 
early on in the negotiations they could have found you know because ultimately uh, afghanistan's future depends on it on afghanistan having an inclusive uh, political structure and i think that's where india's challenge lies that india needs that political structure sus uh, that sustainable model so that the long term the, the longevity of afghanistan's political structure itself becomes a reason for regional stability and unless that happens india will not be happy and india will not be satisfied because the fundamentals in afghanistan will always be challenging and that will challenge the regional re regional structures and that is i think the real issue at the moment that we are facing so for india uh, when when india looks at some of these questions right now of course there has been a setback but i think this this idea that somehow it's going to be a new era india was from the very beginning very very um, uh, you know uh, upfront about it that we are not going to see any major change and i think india has been uh, relatively uh, right on most of these issues and and uh, and and i think there is there is quite a lot of validity in, in that stance and therefore we we see now a great degree of engagement with india when you are looking at certain countries and i would say you know there was one particular week a few weeks back when both you had uh, secretary us secretary of state in india and uh, russian national security advisor in india both talking about afghanistan because i think there is a sense from both of them that something uh, that you know they had missed something fundamental and india has gotten something fundamentally right in afghanistan so i think that leads us into this territory where now india is engaging with those with with several of its partners uh, and i hope including with canada on this question of what potentially can be done uh, in uh, in man in making sure that uh, that the the regime uh, the, the taliban regime in afghanistan gets increasingly marginalized and we can bring in various stakeholders out and i think uh, that the, those stakeholders uh, you you know when when you talk of those school stakeholders there are multiple stakeholders and they all want some some sort of help i think it's extraordinary today that we are not Uh, that the international community as a whole is not willing to stand up for those stakeholders those those political minorities who are actually crying for attention and no one is listening to them but i and but i think uh, for india that is important in some in, in some regards to give uh, to bring that all inclusive nature to this political conversation back because that is in india's interest and from india's perspective that is in regional interest we can't really be playing one group against the other in in, in afghanistan because that is going to be a very dangerous precedent in terms of the you know the, the regional security calculus and that is precisely why we are looking at this the sort of an engagement on under what terms and conditions india and with its like minded country with with its partners like minded partners is going to move ahead on some of these issues like humanitarian ones that we are discussing or the basic issues on providing basic aid that india has had uh, you know has has been looking at but i think the 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 the, the biggest issue remains that as you pointed out uh, shob uh that you know the china factor remains so prominent and in some ways uh, continues to shape a large part of this conversation and i think uh, you know i would agree with sushant that a lot of this is uh, is basically a myth because china's ability to shape uh, or even the or even an interest in shaping some of the very conflict ridden societies conflict ridden states that it has found itself engaged with has been very limited we have not really seen china going out of its way in investing in countries where there is fundamental instability and i think afghanistan is one country where uh, you know instability <laughs> reigns it looms large so i don't i don't really see china coming out uh, you know uh, with a great uh, checkbook and signing uh, lots of checks but i think this is again this is a narrative that pakistan has been selling to to those who are willing to listen you know this idea that taliban are in pakistan's pocket and pakistan is in china's pocket and therefore we will eventually see uh, some great economic revival of afghanistan again that's a myth that has been sold uh, and that is being sold again and again and i don't i mean uh, from the ground realities it doesn't seem like that anything of that is happening uh, in fact what you what you hear again and again from china is china expecting international community and the west to come in and and uh, de deliver aid so it's quite ironical you know once first you say uh, you know the western forces should leave and then you say west please come come ahead and you know right out uh, out front in the queue and deliver the aid so i think you know i don't see china doing anything more or anything less yes they have a strategic interest but those strategic interests are couched in a sense of are couched in a sense of pragmatism that if they get it they will you know they will certainly be, make the most of it and again here uh, the west and india both will have to be very careful that we do not give that space to china that you know we do all the humanitarian work and chinese then go in and get all the minerals 
we don't want to be in that situation we we want you know we, we want to be in a situation where we have some of the cards to play and increasingly we have seen when it comes to china we have uh, you know we have just given up all the cards even before playing a good hand so i don't i, I don't i think from india's perspective especially given the, the state of sino indian relations uh, we, uh, india is any in, in any hurry or even in any illusion that china is going to save afghanistan but certainly the sino uh, the china park access does create pressure on india's borders on india's region on on various strategic aspects for india and that remains a worry that along with the the boost that taliban's victory has given to all sorts of uh, you know nuisance actors uh, china pakistan access also gets strengthened at least a perception of that gets strengthened and pakistan can use that as a bulwark against india that is a you know that is an operational challenge for india not a strategic challenge uh, but the strategically i think the big challenge in, in in afghanistan for india remains one where over a period of time india india can see a a government that is sustainable a political structure that is sustainable and unless that happens uh, and i think that's a that's a point of conversation the one the, the issue that you raised with with like minded countries as to what what can potentially be done about it. and i think that's you know that's something that we need to start the conversation with rather than talking solely about the fact that taliban are in power and whether we recognize them or not i think that that is something you know uh, that is perhaps a conversation for yesterday for the future the conversation is what do we do in terms of making sure that whichever government comes it it, it you know it it lasts it sustains and it has a governance model because unless you have a governance model unless the government has a governance model we are really not going to see some of these fundamental challenges that i think koshi and sushant and chris have been talking about what what do we do in afghanistan what how do we make sure that afghanistan becomes self sustaining after all that was the whole entire logic of uh, of doing the kind of developmental work and the kind of political work that that we had seen in the past so i think that is where our efforts should be based and given the resources whichever whatever resources we can muster that should be the point uh, the starting point of the conversation at least no well, excellent i and i really appreciate you sort of laying it out that way in terms of what the perspective is from new delhi as you were speaking harsh i was thinking how different india sounds today than it did in the midst of the cold war because you know many decades ago we saw pakistan nestled comfortably into the western alliance whether through its status at nato or its relationships with the united states while well, india this historic record has been more non-alignment uh with some suspicion around what the international community was um aiming to achieve um so shan when you look at what harsh has described about this transformation of india's outlook in afghanistan for a sustainable uh framework for resilient governance of some variety and you think of pakistan's changing role from partnered with the west and now deeply partnered with china at least cosmetically if not uh materially in afghanistan yet um where do you see india's opportunity for leadership really um presented to the world as a locus for how those conversations can happen for what comes next as uh harsh has 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 described sure i think uh, uh, you know we don't really need to crave for a leadership role i think the fact that uh, we have had probably the most consistent position in so far as afghanistan is concerned over the last 20 years uh, i think there has been a lot of vacillation uh, even in the western countries on what to do next especially uh, from around 2010 uh, i harsh mentioned the london conference and i think that was the start point where this fiction of a reconcilable taliban uh, came up uh, and i always used to tell people that look if the taliban were reconcilable they would not remain taliban and in fact that is something uh, we need to really consider because uh, in all the stuff which we are talking about uh, yes uh, human rights women rights all of those those were remarkable accomplishments uh, of uh, you know the, of of the west in afghanistan uh, and i think uh, they have not been highlighted enough uh, in in this whole military failure and strategic failure the amount of uh, you know good work that was done has very often been you know brushed under the carpet but the, the but the thing is that uh, this this fiction that you could talk to the taliban you can deal with the taliban uh, that these are you know and all i don't want to name people 
but we all know about those characters uh, who were selling us this nonsense that you know these are guys you can uh, you know who are basically afghan or pashtun nationalists that is a load of hogwash right and we are seeing that happen the fact that the taliban are not going to severe connections with any of the terrorist groups they were terrorists themselves till about 2 months back but uh, even if you put that on the side uh the fact is that they are not going to severe their connections with any of those terror groups uh they will tell the world much like their 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 their, their, their patrons in pakistan do that uh, you know uh, we are not going to be we are not going to allow our soil to be used against any other country incidentally the pakistanis promised us that in 2004 uh, and and we know how that's turned out over the last 17 odd years uh so to think that what the taliban are promising to the world is going to come true it's not going to happen number 2 i think we need to be extremely careful that uh, you know this again this ploy which the pakistanis are using that you need to incentivize the taliban uh, so that they do the right thing listen uh, i think we need to be very clear in our heads giving women their natural rights giving minorities their rights is not a concession it is not a negotiable position you cannot say okay fine i will send girls from class 6 to class 12 to uh, i will allow them to go to school you give me so much i'm sorry i don't think we should be in that kind of a negotiation mode and that is where we need to start putting the foot down because this is the this is the uh, kind of negotiating tactic which the pakistanis are using and you can see and i'm not making this up uh, the foreign minister the nsa everybody has said you need to incentivize the taliban what do you mean by incentivize the taliban that you give them money you give them assistance you give them whatever they want and in return they will give you this they will allow the minorities a, a freedom of re- a religion is that uh, what we are now going to be uh, talking about in so far as afghanistan is concerned that is the second the third part is i think again we need to be extremely careful and uh, and and i am saying this because this is uh, 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 this is the this is the these are the points on which uh, democracies like canada and india need to work together have a kind of a political and diplomatic coordination so that uh, when when we talk about this issue we are coming from the same place and we want to go to the same place Uh, unfortunately between india and america while we agreed what needed to happen we didn't agree on how it should happen uh, so for example uh, the, the the americans thought that uh, you know throwing money at the problem would sort it out uh, we were very clear that it's not going to sort it out it's actually uh, uh, actually leading to this problem becoming bigger than what it 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 ought to be uh so i think it's very important when we uh, talk uh, india and canada for example talk uh, we need to uh, come on the same page uh, politically and diplomatically so that uh, you know we, we are sending the same message wherever it has to go and that message has to be that look even if a regime like the taliban were to pretend and i use the word advisedly were to pretend that they are at worst an ex- ultra conservative kind of a regime uh, and they are going to be at peace with the rest of the world i don't think we should buy that uh and and i'm not saying that let's go and bombard uh, afghanistan back into the stone age certainly not far from it I, that's not my position but what i'm saying is uh, that uh, that this this thing which is going to come that look just because we have a certain way of life does not mean that you know you impose your value systems on us i'm sorry we are not imposing our value systems on us on on you what we are asking you to do is behave like decent human beings uh, and that's the least we can ask you to do uh, in exchange for whatever else uh, engagement we have with you but this cannot be a negotiating tool not for the taliban not for the pakistanis and i think they need to be uh, told this and finally i think uh, you know the, i i think the pakistanis as usual have overplayed their hand uh and they think that they can play chicken with the rest of the world they can uh, they can uh, you know uh, leverage the humanitarian crisis uh, to their advantage uh, they can leverage whatever influence they wield to their advantage and i think we need to stare them down uh, i think in this game of chicken uh, the, the 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 civilized world 
needs to tell them where the Pakistanis get off. That this this thing is not going to be done on the way they want it to be done. So, uh, so I think the the broad position which India has taken is is something which uh, I, I won't call it a leadership thing, but I think uh, we have uh, been proven more or less correct in our assessment of the situation. We might have messed up on a couple of things in, in, in terms of how things are likely to play out. But I think everybody else did. But broadly, I think our approach on Afghanistan has been the most realistic. Uh, not looking at, uh, you know, uh, uh, which group we are going to be dealing with, but trying to look at the people in Afghanistan. So that is one part of it. The other part of it is that I think uh, we need to coordinate uh, how we are going to do things. Uh, if each country... Uh, for a variety of reasons, wants to do things their own way, uh, then I think we lose the plot. So it's it's important that uh, you know we we tend to work together. And finally, I think uh, I think Harsh alluded to it, and I'll just add to it. And I and I am looking at it from my perspective as an Indian. That look, an Afghanistan which is uh, at peace with itself uh becomes uh, uh becomes you know a factor of stability in the entire region but in afghanistan which is constantly at war i think uh, becomes a destabilizing factor in the entire region and i don't see how under a taliban regime afghanistan can be at peace with itself i don't look I, i'm sorry i'm taking too much time but i'll just finish in two sentences the Taliban are not indigenous to Afghanistan. Afghans were not suicide bombers. Suicide bombing has come to Afghanistan from the Arab world. Taliban have come to Pakistan uh, to Afghanistan from Pakistan. It's a Pakistani export into Afghanistan. We never saw this kind, this variety of fanaticism in Afghanistan, at least not in the last 40, 50 years before the Taliban came in. And Afghanistan was, you know, moving towards, uh, like most other ancient societies, uh, uh, to a better uh, future. Before it was all kind of uh, messed up by the Soviets and then later all these fellows. So I think we need to be very careful on what we are dealing with. We need to be realistic with what we are dealing with. And we should not make Faustian bargains because, you know, we'll get some temporary advantage uh, in, in Afghanistan because that would be disastrous uh, going forward and don't look at it only for the next six months, one year, five years. Look at it from the perspective of the next 50 years. Uh, and then uh, maybe you'll be able to uh, get a, a sensible policy in place insofar as Afghanistan is concerned. Yeah, excellent, Sushant. Um, let me let me reinforce a little bit of what you've said because I think you've, you said some very many important things. Um, I used to run large scale public opinion polling in Afghanistan. And consistently, year in and year out, across Afghan demography and geography, India was always perceived as the most favored partner to Afghans by the own perspective of the Afghan people. Pakistan has always been closer to the bottom of that list. Um, this is interesting to me that the realists' um, consistent position in Afghanistan, the realist position, is to not lead with our values by outright conceding our values in the first place. I think that's a really important comment that we've heard from Sushant coming from India, particularly on um, what uh, can prescribe the conversations around Afghanistan's future. Chris, I'm gonna to turn to you now because I think that Sushant, Harsh, Khorshid, and sadly we've lost Kriti because of some technological tech, uh, tech, tech issues. Um, where in the world? I mean, you've seen the conversations from Khan. Uh, Shuf, about. can I just come in? Shuf, yeah. can I just say something before Chris comes in? I think, yeah. you know, we've had a lot of discussions in India, uh, you know, of, of people taking the cynical position that let's be realists. Uh, we've had former diplomats, all sorts of other people saying that, look, let's be realists. Let's, we are in the world of real politics. Uh, and we need to start talking to the Taliban, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And my position has been uh, that uh, real politic demands that you take a moral stand on what is happening in Afghanistan. Uh, 
it is it is I, and i'm not coming from you know i i'm i'm not one of those bleeding heart liberal types i'm a hard nosed kind of a guy uh, and i believe that taking the moral stand in afghanistan is the real political position rather than uh, making this faustian bargain with an abomination like the taliban sorry uh, chris uh, please go ahead no the point point's been well made and so you know chris you know in the around the world and especially in the west perhaps even in canada you see people ready to dispense with the realists advice of standing with our values with the afghan people and their rights where do the conversations uh, around the security of afghanistan wh where should they be happening now can canada and india partner up on creating those spaces to talk about the security of the country can canada and india partner up on talking about the long term sustainable um development um socially and economically of the people where where can those conversations be held and then finally uh when you look at the the political management of those who occupy Afghanistan today and the aspiration of their people in the long term where in the world do you see the conversations around the politics of Afghanistan being governed by i'd be curious to draw on your experience as a diplomat and for somebody who says india for what the potential it has been for all along as a friend of india as well i'd be curious to see you know how do you see that discussion happening and how can canada and india work together to shape the the coming age. Thank you. And I'm going to hold my microphone up here. Is it better now? No feedback? OK. Um, those are great questions. Uh, and Sushant and Harsh and Khorshid, I, I hardly endorse uh, the points you've been making. But to carry them forward, there is this issue of leadership. And uh, you know, we could have a whole session about these issues. So let me boil it down to a few points that uh, that come to me immediately. I mean, first, there has to be a grassroots aspect to this. It cannot be um, a few policymakers locked up in a NSC kitchen, you know, talking about AFPAC or some other dreadful um, framework for failure the way we've done these things in the past 20 years. There needs to be, building on Sushant's point, uh, a sense of moral outrage and a sense of moral imperative and humanitarian imperative that is shared widely, is pushed widely on social media. Journalists have a role to play here. Governments have a role to play here. We should all be leaning into that effort to create these waves of support for doing right by Afghanistan because it matters to all of Asia and the wider world. But secondly, there's this issue of, 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 of what you do with that goodwill and that moral uh, standing once it has been seeded and once it is growing. And I think it is growing now. I mean, these, they, 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 it's not the headlines anymore, but you talk to people in the streets of Edmonton or Newcastle or Warsaw or Mumbai or Kyoto, I think they will all have a sense that something really dreadful happened in Afghanistan and that we were all connected to it uh, and that it's not going to go away. We may not know what to do right now, but it's going to be on the agenda. So where's the leadership going to come from? Let me answer that quickly. India is in the strongest position to take leadership. And it's an uncomfortable role, you know, not for Sushant and Harsh, but for Indian politicians and India generally, because uh, there is this long legacy of uh, wanting to deal with regional issues bilaterally. Um, not wanting to engage a vast and usually unwieldy international system for some regional purpose. A and then of uh, a strong legacy of being ignored, you know, which Sushant and not totally ignored, but not taken as seriously as Delhi should have been on Indian affairs over the last 20 years. Um, but I think that can be overcome. Uh, and so there's an opportunity here for India. Plus, we should all be involved, and India and those of us in Canada concerned about this should be involved uh, in, in 
uh, looking for other uh, nodes of leadership. Some might be Europe. We might have a first minister or minister, prime minister in uh, a Nordic country or in France, uh, who knows, who takes a principled position on these issues. Um, Japan, I think, has yet to pronounce, uh, has always had thoughtful and deep views on Afghanistan. Uh, and then there's the whole issue of Washington. And here, uh, I think we all need to get much more serious about where Washington stands and what, um, what the future could look like, because there is no leadership coming from either side of the aisle of these troubled parties at the moment. But there's an opportunity um, to, to, uh, to, to find that leadership for three reasons. One, uh, if there is bilateral bipartisan consensus to build a coalition that stands up to Chinese belligerents, and if that's now playing out in the quad and uh, the diplomacy over the two Michaels and trade issues and many other fronts, then that effort is not complete until someone deals with the fact that Afghanistan is under military occupation by, Pakistan, by China's main ally. Uh, and the issue here, I think all the issues we're talking about, you know, making our moral outrage mean something, taking action, building uh, uh, an Afghan economy that's sustainable, breaking with a past that has been disastrous for 50 years and even longer, uh, a, a past in Afghanistan, it has to start with holding those responsible for this debacle to account. Uh, and you know my views on this, but I, I think it's worth re-emphasizing in, in this context that there is no other state-to-state -state context, bilateral relationship, in which one country would have uh, engaged in acts of aggression on this scale against the other country and faced no consequences, no sanctions, no embargo, no um, officially assigned political blame, let alone military consequences, which are provided for in the UN Charter in these cases for what they have done. So that discussion has to continue. We need to talk about Afghanistan, but we need to make Pakistan's generals, not the country, the, the architects of this policy in GHQ, ISI, and their allies outside own this issue. They need to own this issue. We have underestimated them every step of the way. I think even a lot of people in India, certainly in the United States, have underestimated the influence uh, and, and harsh uh, agenda of the Mirza Aslam Khans, even of Musharraf, certainly of Kayani and their successors today. Look at the commentary over changing the DGISI in the last few days. Westerners are so eager to say, oh, he's been punished because he went too far with the Taliban. That's absolute crap. He is being rewarded with one of the most prestigious core commands. He is um, going to continue playing a role in the uh, camouflage operations that the army is undertaking to pretend that the Taliban can be useful fighting more extreme groups. And then he will be in the running to be chief of the army staff as a reward for having, uh, you know, run circles around all of us for his time in office and on behalf of generals who've been dominating Pakistan's strategic policy making for 50 years. So um, let's find the leadership, let's build the grassroots, but let's start to assign the accountability that gives us leverage over all the issues we care about, economic, humanitarian, political, etc. In an af a, a vacuum of accountability and near infinite impunity, which these guys still enjoy, we're not going to be able to do anything. Thank you for that, Chris. I think you, you've prescribed a to-do list and suggested ways in which uh, India can lead um, in the conversation. I actually want to take a point because uh, in the recent Quad leadership meeting, we saw language coming from Japan, Australia, um, uh, India, and 
uh, America that was very strong uh, on accountability around those who were sponsoring terrorism inside uh, Afghanistan uh, and the proxy war, the specific language around proxy war. I think that's probably part of the equation of getting it right, if, if I could suggest it as a first step of how we think about cooperation among democracies in the security and defense of those who believe in democracy, beginning first, of course, with the Afghan people. Can I just um, jump in, Shuv, real quick? I'm going to interrupt as well. Um, I just want to say, though, that this you're hitting upon something, Chris, everyone here. There is like, I don't understand. And I guess maybe we could have another conversation another time because I know we're running out of time. But this aversion that the United States has about facing facts and being honest about what's going on with Pakistan and their influence in Afghanistan. It's like, it's it, nobody wants to touch upon it. It, but, and yet we know that this is yes. the, the source of so much of what's happening that's going wrong in Afghanistan and has for many years, but we're emboldening. The U S government continues to embolden. There's this weird relationship. So I think most Americans have no clue and many Westerners have no clue. And so if if part of it is moral outrage and stepping up and calling out and having accountability, that's one of the key areas that needs to be addressed. Um, and a lot of people don't want to hear it, but that is the truth. Let, let me um, spell out for you just how bad it is. <clears throat> it's ignorance in the American body politic, but it is ignorance that has become an addiction and has become institutionalized. There is no think tank in the United States, not one, that has focused on this issue in a sustained way at all. Because they're um, backed, you know what? Because they are backed by a lot exactly. of money coming from Pakistan. Exactly, and, and just in the last few weeks, as we've all been agonizing over these issues, who has their voice out there in principal US media? It is Imran Khan, it is Mouhid Yusuf, it is only Pakistani spokespersons that are facing the U.S. political audience on this issue in a sustained way. And on top of that, Pakistan, literally the DGSPR, owns the New York Times office in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. They own the BBC. They own the principal uh, mouthpieces for any information that's coming from that region. And countering that, is is extremely hard it's baked in it's institutionalized yeah. uh, and it spreads into cnn and elsewhere and there's really no counter to it at the moment thank you for that i think this is a good chance to start rounding out this discussion and i'm actually grateful for she you went in that direction because i wanted to ask you why was there such a uh, a gap in the strategic considerations in Washington. I think you and Chris just kind of displayed that perfectly. What the what the challenges are. Honest sources of inter of reliable information are a greater greater scarcity in, in the road ahead. Uh, let me turn quickly to Sushant and then to Professor Harsh Pant for final comments, uh, and then uh, we'll round out our discussion today. Sushant. So uh, Shiv, you know, just taking off from where uh, Krushi then. Uh, uh, Chris left off. Sorry, Shub. Um, you know, uh, the thing is that uh, the, the greater travesty is that even uh, when, when they give the floor to somebody like a Muiz Yusuf or an Imran Khan or any of the others, the people interviewing them have absolutely no idea about the subject they're interviewing on. And they, they come with a set of some questions and then they probably ask a couple of follow-ons without understanding the intricacies of uh, what the Pakistanis have been doing over the last 20 years. Uh, so that becomes even a bigger problem. Uh, and uh, and then within the, uh, you know, within the governmental system, there is no real historical memory of how things have been playing out. Uh, so so that has been, that's been a systemic and a structural problem insofar as the Americans are concerned, which for somebody like me sitting in India, I find very surprising. Because, you know, uh, we've always uh, kept American scholarship or Western scholarship on a very high pedestal. But when we see it actually play itself out on the ground, then, uh, you know, you wonder uh, what we were admiring. Uh, and, and let me tell you one personal experience. Uh, I, again, won't take any names. It was a U.S. congressman. And the biggest hint I can give was 
uh, of Indian origin, but I won't tell you from which part of the US he was. And I'm talking about a conversation I had almost seven or eight years back. And I it, it was shocking for me and I, I, I was outraged when, and, and this is around the time of the London conference, so about almost 11, 12 years, 10, 11, 10 years back. His proposal back then was that, listen, the Pakistanis don't like Indian presence in Afghanistan, but India is wanted by the Afghans. So a via media can be that you keep funding all the projects through Pakistan. We give the money to the Pakistanis to build projects in Afghanistan so that we have absolutely no say and no presence in Afghanistan. Uh, now, you, you know, the mind boggles at the kind of nonsense uh, which went for policy in these countries. But having said that, I think uh, Chris touched upon a very important point, and that was on the Quad. And I'm glad that the Quad declaration this time uh, did speak about what is happening in Afghanistan. Because until now, what we've heard from the Americans, uh, policy makers and uh, policy wonks, was that, look, we are in complete agreement with you or at least 95% agreement with you east of India. But we have only about 5% convergence with you west of India. And that was okay as long as the Americans were present in Afghanistan because, you know, the fallout of whatever happened in Afghanistan was limited because of the American presence. But now that they are not there, I don't see how convergence east of India can work if there is no convergence west of India. And I think Probably, maybe I'm, 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 and per perhaps Professor Pant can uh, either bear me out or shoot me down. But I thought that what happened in the Quad Declaration this time suggests that there is now a greater understanding of India's predicament west of India, which was earlier ignored, uh, than what it was in the past. So perhaps we might be able to, you know. Uh, Okay, let me just say, knock some sense into American heads uh, and, and, and get them on board. And perhaps that is another thing uh, which both MLI and ORF can work together on to try and convince the Americans where they are going wrong. And perhaps they should take our lead uh, in, in, in this particular thing. Thanks. Many thanks. Harsh? Yeah, no, I think uh, just, just two points. One, um, you know, one, I agree that... Uh, I think uh, over the last few years, uh, I think especially in the last two years, we have seen uh, on the Afghanistan question, uh, I think gradually US and India are coming to terms with what is, you know, what is, what the reality is on the ground and acknowledging each other's concerns. I think this has been a perennial problem. Uh, you know, Khushi talked about uh, Afghanistan, but India has had a long standing problem. You know, we were. We were being attacked by Pakistan-based terror groups, and we, we were being told that it's your problem. It's, it's an indigenous problem. It's a human rights problem. It's a problem that Indian government is creating within its own territories. So I think uh, you know that has been a long-standing uh, issue with with regard to what uh, the the role that Pakistan plays in Indian uh, in American strategic imagination, and that has been you know the the you know the the, the job. The, often we are told that it's a it's a very important geography. Sometimes we are told it's a nuclear weapon state, uh, so so it's very difficult to get them off off board. But, but so so there are always excuses and there are always you know some rational or the other. But I think uh, in some ways perhaps America getting out of Afghanistan also has opened up this opportunity to have a more honest conversation about uh, about Pakistan and its role in the region between New Delhi and Washington. So I hope this becomes uh, you know the norm. And what is also, I think, perhaps is happening as as uh, uh, as America reimagines its Indo-Pacific policy, as Prashant was saying, to the East, uh, we are looking at a number of uh, partners from the East that are supporting uh, India's case. So, for example, Australia has taken an extraordinarily strong view on uh, on Afghanistan issue with, with India. Uh, similarly, Japan has taken an unusually, you know, they, uh, Japan has not really been very vocal about, it, but this time it has been. So I think we are we are looking at it, that convergence, perhaps pushing Washington in a direction that may be helpful for these these kinds of conversations. Uh, but just to end on Pakistan, uh, you know, I think uh, we also have to give them some credit. You know, they it, it's a uh, 
you know, it's it's a down in the dumps economy. Nothing seems to be going right for them, and yet they managed to do some very effective diplomacy in Washington, uh, which is, I think, something that uh, perhaps Indians can learn, and Afghans can learn, and Canadians can learn. And I think <laughs> uh, that you know th this is also part of their uh, part of their charm. They are very charming people, I'm told, uh, when it comes to um, doing diplomacy in, in world capitals. So London and Washington are pretty pretty famous. So we you know. There is always there. You always have to learn. There's always a potential to learn from 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 there as well. <laughs> well put, Harsh. Um, I would just conclude with this. Uh, I'm sad to say that we've run out of time, but I'm encouraged to report that we will make more time. Um, this is the inaugural discussion that um, India's Observer Research Foundation and Canada's McDonald Laurier Institute are convening around critical issues defining. The coming age. Uh, I'm so very honored and proud that we've been able to assemble such a fascinating, not just a constellation of people, but range of topics that we covered together. So let me offer thanks first to uh, Kriti, who sadly had to drop off because of technical issues, uh, to Horshid, to Chris, to Sushant, and to Harsh for a masterclass of what are the critical things we're dealing with in this strategic theater that is called Afghanistan, but also a story of some 35, 40 million people whom the world has been trying to cooperate to help um, every single day since the events of 9-11. Uh, let me also take note of, if you if you indulge me, um, of uh, ORF America's director, Dhruva Jaishankar. He published a piece recently about um, how Afghanistan itself impacts four strategic theaters whether it's Central Asia, the Indo-Pacific region, South Asia, um, and even for, further east in terms of the American retreat raises questions about whether or not the West and the United States would bolster the sovereignty of places like Taiwan or the principle of the rule of law and freedom of navigation across the Indo-Pacific theater. Afghanistan does represent not just um, the story of a realigned global order, but the opportunity of um, democracies like India and Canada to engage in new and novel ways around the critical issues that will define the next 15 to 20 years to come. So thank you all for kicking off this series in such a profoundly uh, thoughtful way. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. We thank you for your time and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. Thank you very much.